Good morning. We're going to get started with this morning's uh, Composers Day. First, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, this, is, this is an exciting opportunity because this is going to be our inaugural H Open Broad Agency Announcement, or BAA. A critical concept behind the Proposers Day is to be authentic about the government's intent and to be able to um, really provide an opportunity for really an upload and download uh, with the, the health ecosystem. So an, an exciting, so we'll, we'll start the board with, uh, um, we're gonna have our vision from our, our director, followed by uh, a little bit more information about uh, some of the technical areas and mission office briefing by Dr. Amy Jenkins and Dr. Jennifer Roberts, um, followed by, um, we're gonna be having uh, acquisition details and next steps from myself. I do wanna point out, we're gonna be having a Q and A portion during this presentation. And one of the key things that we're gonna be having is, um, we expect for at around 12, if you could, uh, please submit your questions in the, in the Q&A or the chat function and uh, recommend you hold any questions until we've completed the presentation uh, in case your question is covered by the presentation. So again, submit your, at around 12 o'clock, submit your questions in the Q&A or chat function. We're going to receive those questions, collate them, and we'll come back at 12.30 for uh, the government's response. A couple of logistical points. Uh, the presentation will be recorded, and to the extent possible, we will share the report uh, and or the slides uh, to everyone. So if we're talking too quickly, uh, hopefully you'll be able to be able to catch up on the on the back end. Uh, next, I would like to introduce our inaugural director, Dr. Renee Wegerson, to speak about her vision for Arva H. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Benjamin. So it's really my utmost pleasure to be able to be here today and share with you a little bit about ARPA H. Uh, what we'll outline for you today is, is what is ARPA H? We're the newest ARPA in the ecosystem. We have the largest customer base of, of any ARPA. All of the American people are part of our customer base. And we recently announced our first solicitation, uh, which is an open broad agency announcement. That's why you're here. And uh, what is that? And we wanna kind of introduce you to that concept. You'll meet some of our technical leadership today to tell you a bit more about that, um, share our initial focus areas that we're interested in pursuing, and then uh, some more of the logistics around uh, that contracting. And we'll have a little bit of time uh, for Q and A at the end. But uh, first, I'd love to just kick off and tell you a little bit about what is ARPA-H and, and where do we fit in this ecosystem? And so first and foremost, our mission above all else is to accelerate better health outcomes for everyone. Uh, success for us really is an improved quality of life uh, in the future for all Americans. And so when we think about those outcomes, we are very focused on deliverables on getting to an end goal, we are less focused on things like great publications, which are important, of course, but uh, we really want to change change lives going forward. And so if, if you share that mission, then you are absolutely in the right place. And we launched just about a year ago um, because of President Biden's vision. So, of course, President Biden launched Cancer Moonshot, but also um, acknowledged that there needs to be an organization for moonshots for all diseases. And he said ARPA-H will pursue ideas that break the mold on how we normally support fundamental research and commercial products in this country. ARPA-H is going to provide funding in places where traditional federal funding and the commercial sector who are uh, can be risk averse uh, really aren't able to provide. This is a place where ideas so audacious that people say that they just might work if and only if you try. And so if you joined us a few minutes before our webinar started, you saw QR codes that announced our ARPA H dash. Uh, that is open to everyone from uh, scientists down to your eighth grader that is really excited um, about ARPA H and what we're going to do. That's a prize challenge we've announced. Um, and that, those aren't R&D dollars. That is, is really a 15K prize to launch. But uh, for us today, it's really focused on uh, the big research dollars for, for the projects that are actually going to break the mold in how we do uh, R&D biomedical research in this country. And the types of ideas uh, are, you know, imagine if we could have a personalized cancer vaccine that costs as little as a cup of coffee. Imagine if a damaged organ could be replaced by one 3D printed in a lab, or imagine if a surgical nanobot could be delivered by a pill. You no longer need to go to a surgical center of excellence. You can have it delivered at home. And so these are futures that are many years away, but we want to be able to plant the seeds and catalyze the work uh, really end to end that is going to enable this capability. And these are the big shots that we want to take here at ARPA-H. 
And we're here to augment the existing ecosystem. This includes our customers. I mentioned we are the, the largest customer base for any ARPA, all American people. This is the public, healthcare providers, and patient groups, patient advocacy groups. Uh, we really want to hear from those folks what will actually improve your quality of life. Our performers, that's you. So uh, folks from academia, from industry, from non-traditional players, and then teams therein. We know that it takes a lot of players to get something across the finish line to commercialize and get things into the real world where we want to have that impact to accelerate better health outcomes for everyone. Our stakeholders, our brothers and sisters at NIH, our federal partners like FDA, the regulators, CMS, the payers that need to be there from day one as we launch and organize these, these programs. When you join ARPA-H and be a part of an ARPA-H funded opportunity, what we bring to the table are these stakeholders. We can move very quickly to be able to align uh, and support your project, but also help it graduate. Success for us is a transaction where we complete a project and move it out of ARPA-H. And so uh, as of uh, the anniversary of our birthday on March 15th, ARPA-H is open for business. The first broad agency announcement, this is now live on the street. Um, I hope you all have had a chance to read it. Uh, one theme that you will hear over and over today is read the BAA. <laughs> we will definitely put FAQs, we will just explain it, but uh, if we are asking you to do something in the BAA, we mean it. It's not open for interpretation. Uh, and, and for example, having a mandatory three-pager um, as a starting place for a conversation with RPH. We wanna hear about your ideas, um, the rough order of magnitude of the time it's going to take to do those and the, the funds it will cost. We're not here, we're not looking for lowest bidder, we're looking for well-resourced projects to solve big problems in health. Site selection, so some of you may have come to our proposers day a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we are establishing three hub site, a hub and spoke network to reach all American people. And our performers will be able to use this network as you set up a program, if you want to set up a clinical trial that will that will bring in uh, the, the customers that are representative of the American population that may be impacted uh, and serve to benefit from your innovation, uh, we will be able to engage you with our hub and spoke model as we establish that. And then last but not least, um, I've already mentioned the ARPA-H dash. This is a bracket style challenge. Uh, we are collecting uh, ideas to seed into the first bracket um, which ends this Friday. So please, um, if you have a great big idea, maybe you're going to submit a full proposal to the Open BAA, good on you, but also we want to hear about those ideas already in the ARPA H dash to be part of this bracket challenge uh, for, for a cash prize. And so um, I do think it's important to, to just spend a moment and talk a little bit about the ARPA H organization within HHS. And so my job when I was sworn in after um, on October 11th of last year, was really focused on um, protecting some of these authorities that allow ARPA-H to do the big audacious goals that, that President Biden um, and the Congress have set out for us. And so um, our unique organizational structure, we are the um, first agency to ever be stood up inside of NIH. We are not an institute of health. We are an independent agency. Um, so what that means is we can lean on a lot of the infrastructure that NIH provides, the subject matter expertise, helped us get running uh, from day one. But I report directly to Secretary Becerra. So he is the Secretary of HHS, and that means we have a lot of autonomy and decision making um, as we move forward. You can really think about ARPA H as almost two sides of the house. We have our business team. So the last five months, we've been very busy establishing our team of contractors, folks like Benjamin, uh, who are going to be able to, to help us um, manage contracts and, and launch those going forward. Our HR team, um, our technical leadership has now joined. Um, and so it's very important to have that all in place. I like to think of this as the minimum viable agency um, as a startup in the federal government to get up and running for, for business. And so, so uh, you're here with the latest startup in government, and we're excited to be here and grow and build in, in this future for health. Um, and we're doing this in service of the other side of our house, which are the program managers. These are folks that are term limited to come on board for um, a three-year initial contract uh, to and they, they bring not only their great CV, but their big idea in health that they want to pursue. And so anyone who is funded under a project, um, even through the Open BA, will ultimately be connected to a program manager, but we are still ramping up that team. But they're uh, a really important, critical part of this. And the urgency, just to demonstrate this, two weeks of time for a program manager in that three-year contract is 1% of their time already spent. So every two weeks, they're down. Their fuse is burning down by 1%. This is the urgency that we, we need to create those better health outcomes. 
Some other points to just flag, we are exclusively a funding agency. So we are not big labs. We're not intramural research. We are an extramural funding agency. Congress has provided us um, in appropriations of two and a half billion dollars to start. Uh, and this funding is actually independent of NIH. We, we, we manage this uh, directly with our, with our federal uh, funding counterparts. Um, we have a, a lean and nimble management structure, so we're a very flat organization that allows us to move quickly. And again, the, the decision making is not by committee or consensus, it is by our program managers. And so um, that's going to be a really important part to, to let us take on that risk um, as we move forward. Really important for this group, you'll know, hear this emphasized again, but I'll, I'll mention it for the first time here. We're not a grant based organization. We're going to focus on cooperative agreements. OTA is this jargon for other transactional um, uh, agreements and then contracts. And so what this means, we're very focused on the end goal. And for those of you that have been part of DARPA or other, other ARPA type programs, there's very active program management. So you should expect that the technical team that um, will select your project and move forward with, they'll have a seat at the table with you and they will make some of the decisions with you and they will They'll sit in your lab meetings if you let them. And so, so just really think about this active program management going forward, very different from other parts of, of the federal government. And so um, these authorities that we've now uh, locked in uh, as of last year really allow us to express our organizational attributes. And so what makes us really unique is that the nucleus of our organization are those program managers. I work for the program managers. Our technical leadership work for the program managers. We want those big ideas and health to move forward, but we know that it, you know this bottoms-up approach isn't the only place where ideas come, and that's really where the open BAA uh, comes into play. So we, this is a place for big ideas to come from the scientific, the technical, the biotech, uh, the health medicine community to come in through that open BAA. Um, we are not looking for your failed proposals that have not worked in other traditional funding resources. We are looking for revolutionary and radical change. So evolutionary proposers need not apply. If you've already de-risked your small molecule and it's ready for phase three clinical trial, ARPA-H is not the place for your funding. So we are, we are looking to create new platforms uh, to really revolutionize health moving forward. In terms of autonomy, I've mentioned this already, our programs are program manager directed. And so um, if you become funded by ARPA-H, you'll become uh, you'll be forming a really strong uh, relationship with your program manager um, who is a steward of the taxpayer dollars, but also wants you to be successful and bring those other stakeholders to the table for you and in hopes of transitioning and getting these capabilities out of ARPA-H and into the real world. And then last but not least, I mentioned this already, but for emphasis, um, I'm term limited, our program managers are term limited, and this is really to create this urgency that uh, leverage the business team that's in place for the program managers to, to launch these concepts and pick up ideas from the open BAA that, that you'll be uh, pursuing and giving it to us for. And then the life cycle of any project, you know, starts with the, the design and organization. One of the themes that you'll hear today is you may submit a project uh, and if we decide to fund it, we may uh, mold it with you. We may, you may propose 10 tasks and we're really excited about seven of those tasks. And we're going to work on that uh, with you, negotiate um, what is what is in best pursuit of your goals and RPH's goals as we move forward. And so uh, designing those programs, landing the, the team to do the work, executing this, making sure you're advancing against the very clear milestones that you have proposed will be important. We're going to learn for our failures. We're going to be technically honest, and we're going to try to give um, these capabilities the best shot of, of making it uh, in the real world as we move forward. This is my last slide before I hand it off, but what I, I really want to emphasize is just, uh, you know, ARPA-H is a place that is here to be a catalyst for the entire health ecosystem. We are going to have program managers that are here for term appointment. Our programs are typically on a two to four year timeline. Our um, open BAA projects will likely be shorter than a program timeline. So, so think huge, big ideas, but where we can get across uh, proofs of concept um, in a year, in two years. Uh, really upfront. So not only will the program managers bring in those ideas, we want to hear uh, these big ideas uh, from you going forward. Again, really excited uh, for the group that's assembled here today. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about the vision of ARPA-H and, and what our role is in this ecosystem. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to our technical leadership and our mission offices, uh, Dr. Amy Jenkins, the director of our Health Science Features Office, and Dr. Jennifer Roberts, the director of our Resilient Systems Office. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Renee. I'm so excited to be here today and really excited to talk to everybody about our Open Broad Agency announcement. I do want to make just a couple quick announcements before I jump into the rationale for the Open BAA. 
I know some folks joined a little late. We will be posting these slides on sam.gov and we will also, po also post a version of the webinar so you can um, watch the webinar recording. So let's jump in. So what is the rationale for an open BAA? As you've heard several times already, the goal of our, our agency is to accelerate better health outcomes for everyone. And our open BAA is really serving three main functions in this towards this goal. The first is that we want the opportunity to pursue novel ideas that are not currently covered by a program. So ultimately, at Steady State, our organization will have many programs led by those program managers that you heard Renee talk about in the previous couple slides. However, we may not always be covering every idea that exists out there. We are a projects agency and we are an ideas agency. And we want to ensure that we're not missing great novel ideas. So our, what we're having this open broad agency announcement out here for is so that you can submit those ideas, even if they may not currently align with a program. Now, many of you may be very astutely looking at our website. We do not have current programs. Those will be launching soon. And so that means that this open broad agency announcement is really an, an opportunity for you to submit those big revolutionary ideas right now. I will talk about what makes something revolutionary in a couple slides. I do want to point out that we have rolling submissions for one year. So our, this, this annou announcement closes in March of 2024, not 2023, but you do not have to wait until 2024 to submit that, um, that abstract. So please, you can submit your abstracts at any time in the next year. Additionally, revolutionary ideas are required here. We are going to talk about what makes something revolutionary, but the I word or incremental is, is not a good word in, um, in an ARPA-like agency. So let's move on to our next slide. So what is the scope of what we're accepting in this open broad agency announcement? We are looking at many different scopes throughout this announcement, but we are interested in things all the way from proof of concept all the way up to showing commercial viability, things that have real world evaluation and are generating evidence, and all encompassing solutions, particularly those disease agnostic approaches. So I'm gonna give an example of what a proof of concept to commercial viability may be. You'll notice my bias and, and my background here, but a proof of concept may be an in vitro demonstration that some technical goal is possible, a very small uh, demonstration. What we may consider something that's a little bit more mid range or slightly larger would be expanding that proof of concept study into animal studies or in vivo studies in larger animals, perhaps maybe even expanding that initial proof of concept into showing that it's maybe a bit more disease agnostic. Finally, we are also considering a value or proposals that may be very large. They may include proof of concept through uh, a larger evaluation and validation, perhaps even into some manufacturing capabilities and even into clinical evaluation. I am gonna come back to that clinical evaluation and you heard Renee talk about it previously, but there are certain types of clinical evaluation that we would be interested in and certain types that we are not interested in. Now, I wanna say that while the scope can range from those proof of concept all the way through to commercial viability, we do have proposal requirements. And one of our biggest requirements is that the project should be scoped appropriately to achieve the technical goals of the proposal. We are looking for a rigorous technical approach as well as cost realism. So you've heard this before, you're going to hear it a lot today. We are not looking for the lowest bidder. We are looking for the proposal that meets these broad audacious goals and has the most, likely success, most likelihood of succeeding recognizing that what we are trying to do is has a lot of high uncertainty, high risk, but the one way to buy down that risk is to have the right people and the right teams working, working together on the, on the proposed approach. So what does that look like? For many of you that may be familiar with other ARPAs, many times people say that ARPAs are amazing and they can do wonderful and awesome things, and that is true. But what is this, one of the secret sauce? In my opinion, one of the most secret sauces of an ARPA is our teaming and collaboration. We really have an ability to bring together groups from disparate technical backgrounds to meet the goals, the audacious goals that we set forth as an agency. And we do those through days like our proposers day and through allowing people the time to submit an abstract where they have time to go and find those collaborators. So we are really looking for people to put forward proposals that are very difficult technically, that are really pushing the bar and are really quite revolutionary. 
but you may not have all of the right groups to do that within your immediate circle of, of collaborators. Perhaps you need to bring folks together that have biology backgrounds and chemistry backgrounds, bringing in engineers and manufacturing experts, uh, maybe even bringing in uh, people that have kind of cyber and data backgrounds. You might bring together all of these groups to try to meet the goals of the types of things that we're trying to do here at ARPA-H. One thing that we want to point out is that there is the potential here to provide end-to-end -end solutions, but it's very rare that the same people that perform the discovery and work on the early phase preclinical are also the same people that are involved in clinical evaluation or production and manufacturing. Therefore, if you want to provide an end-to-end -end approach or an end-to-end -end solution, you often need to bring together a large team of collaborators, and we very much anticipate large teams of collaborators um, and, and much teaming to achieve these goals. It's very rare that one team can do it all. Now, I do want to talk through what makes something evolutionary versus revolutionary. You've heard us say this several times today. So define it. What we are not is we are not funding something incremental and we want very audacious revolutionary goals. But what does revolutionary actually mean? It can be quite subjective. And so we're gonna give you a couple different examples of ways that we see things that are revolutionary. So one way that you can do this is through reframing. So leveraging insights from those different fields. You heard me talk about it previously. You may be a biologist or a biochemist or a, a chemist, maybe bringing folks from electrical engineering backgrounds or data backgrounds that really take a new view on something to achieve some of these re really novel goals. You can certainly consider the idea of recasting a traditional problem, um, often from first principles, to reveal a new technical white space. What haven't we thought of before? To really challenge those technical assumptions and push the science forward. We really want the people to think, what are the gaps? And, and be very creative about how those could be, um, could be solved. But more importantly, what we don't want people to do is get bogged down in their traditional dogma. And it's really important to be able to go out and find other people that think about problems in a different way and reframe those problems so that we can achieve goals that a lot of people say, yeah, that's impossible because I've been looking at that for 10 years. Maybe you need a new set of eyes. Um, scaling. So this is an opportunity to really think about some of the metrics that you may measure success by. You may measure success by the speed, the size of a device, the power of the device, the resolution. If you think of a, a particular metric, we want you to think of that metric, and then we want you to multiply it by a hundredfold. And that's the change that we're looking for. So if you may say to yourself, well, I think we could do this discovery campaign in four months. We're looking for solutions that allow you to do that discovery campaign in under a day. If we're looking at an instrument or a device, or a manufacturing capability that fills a room, we want you to think about how are we gonna shrink that down to the size of my laptop? So we wanna think about these bold, very large orders of magnitude change in the scale. And then finally, we wanna think about complexity. One other way to think about a revolutionary idea, maybe in the complexity of the disparate parts. So oftentimes, some of the integration of disparate components is actually what makes them quite revolutionary. And when you combine those disparate components in a novel way, it actually makes it revolutionary compared to the sum of those parts. So if I'm going to talk about what's revolutionary and what we want, I'll also talk about what we don't want. Some of these are stated explicitly in our BAA on page four, but I'll just talk through them a little bit. So that first one, we've now hit it many times. We are not looking for incremental advances in the current state of the art. We want you to think about what is possible in the next five years, that's current state of the art. What's possible in the next 35 years and bring that into the next five years, those are the, those are the types of, of advances we're looking for. We, want, we do not want um, anything that directs towards policy change. We are not a policy organization. We are an R&D funding organization. The third one down, maybe um, quite importantly to this audience, we are not looking to fund specific product development. So if you have drug X, that you've developed through preclinical development, maybe you have some early clinical um, evaluation on that and you want to take it further into the clinic or evaluate that drug against disease Y in a further clinical study, that's not appropriate for ARPA-H. That is more appropriate for advanced development agencies, not for the, the type of R&D organization that we are, are um, funding. Now, I will say that people ask, will you fund clinical trials? We absolutely anticipate funding clinical studies. But those clinical studies will be proof of concept 
that, that an approach works um, that may be agnostic to several disease states. It may be an entirely new approach that we have to demonstrate and de-risk through clinical evaluation, but what we are not doing is just one-on-one -on -one product development. Next, we are not looking at traditional education or training. We are not providing center coordination and we will not construct physical infrastructure. So we will not build brick and mortar um, buildings and we will not build brick and mortar um, laboratories as part, of our, as part of our funding. So with that, I am going to stop talking about the Open Broad Agency announcement rationale and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Roberts, to talk about some of the focus areas that we have at ARPA-H. Great. Thanks, Amy. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the technical focus areas that we're interested in. And before I get started, I just want to highlight again that we are interested in accelerating the improvement of health outcomes for everyone. So at a broad level, we're interested in many different approaches that can ultimately improve health outcomes. Now that's very broad, uh, very multifaceted. So we're gonna break that down into four different areas, the health science future, scalable solutions, proactive health and resilient systems to give you a better sense of what types of things might be in scope. Um, now, before I jump into each of those focus areas, I also want to just highlight that there's a couple of cross-cutting themes um, that we are interested in across different application areas. And the first is quantitative measurement of health outcomes. Our, all, our overall mission is to improve health outcomes. The easiest way to do that is if we can measure whether um, health outcomes are changing over time. So anything with new sensors or new approaches to better measure um, what's happening with outcomes is of interest. We're also interested in human-centered design. We want to be designing approaches that uh, help patient populations and help clinicians and the end user in a way um, that they find useful. So that leads us to our third point. We are interested in participatory research models. So if you know that your technology is ultimately intended for a particular user community, it would be great to include those voices throughout the research process in order to not just push on the technical innovation, but also the way in which that tech and technical innovation will be packaged and meet the end user so that we're developing things that people want to use. And then finally, in a number of areas, there might be ethical, legal, or societal implications. So we're also interested in advances that take those considerations into account so that we can de be developing new revolutionary technology in a way that is ethical and responsible. So now talking a bit about the first focus area, and before I dive into the technical aspects, I want to just highlight that for each of these focus, focus areas, I'll be talking about the overarching theme to give you a sense of what's in scope. And on each slide, there's a series of examples. Now in the Open BAA, which I encourage you to read, there's a longer set of examples. And what's important to note about these, these examples is that these are not comprehensive. We are interested in ideas that are creative and maybe are not on the list as well. So the, um, the scope and examples that I'll run through are intended to just get the juices flowing. Again, we want revolutionary ideas that fit into that overarching mission of accelerating the improvement of health outcomes for everyone. Okay, so now with that said, moving into the first focus area, both health science futures. So this focus area is all about core fundamental scientific advances in order to change our perception of what's possible as we treat disease and diagnose disease. So uh, one thrust is likely to be new tools, technologies, and platforms that broadly apply to many different diseases. Um, we are also interested in new innovations that can help us better treat a disease or diagnose a disease um, that affects a large population. So things like cancer or heart disease or diabetes or Alzheimer's. Likewise, we're interested in innovations that can help us with rare diseases or diseases where we currently have limited treatment uh, options. 
So moving into the second area, scalable solutions. This is one where we're really trying to make sure that the technologies that we have today can reach everyone who needs them. So sometimes we might have an existing technology or treatment option that is really only available in an academic medical center, but it would be great to have that available in a home healthcare setting. So um, some of the thrusts here um, might look at how we miniaturize or repackage technology to help meet people where they are. This area is also about access and affordability. So uh, perhaps we have a particular treatment that uh, is at a high price point and we need to be thinking about new ways to approach distribution or manufacture, manufacturing in order to create economies of scale. So instead of that treatment being available to perhaps 5% of the patient population, it can really reach 100%. Then the third area is proactive health. So here we're interested in prolonging periods of health and well being. And when people do become sick, we want to help them recover more quickly. So proactive health can include thrusts like preventative, me preventative medicine or uh, early diagnostics in order to be able to help people. Um, uh, avoid getting sick in the first place. We're also interested in technologies that might help people age in place. So how do we prolong those periods where people are healthy and active and maintain their independence? And finally, we're also interested in things that help accelerate recovery or perhaps provide new types of regenerative capabilities. Then the fourth area is resilient systems. And here we're trying to foster the creation of robustness and adaptability inside systems that affect our health. Um, and we wanna foster this um, resilience and adaptability in systems from the molecular to the societal scale. So a canonical example is how do we make our health and public health systems more uh, responsive and adaptable in the face of an adverse event like a pandemic. So we can think about supply chains, we can think about uh, electronic health record systems. How do we make all of these things more resilient and reliable? But within this resilience thrust, we can also think about other things like the communication between a clinician and a patient. Are there innovations that could make that, that communication, which is very important for health outcomes, um, more reliable, more resilient um, to, to different types of events um, and um, uh, community types. So just to reiterate again, these are just a few of the focus areas that, that we are interested in. For each of these, we do have our examples in the BAA uh, and on the slides, but these are not an exhaustive list. So we are interested in creative revolutionary ideas to help us improve um, patient outcomes for everyone. And now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Mr. Ben Bryant, in order to talk through acquisition. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, so I, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. Um, my name is Benjamin Bryant, and I'm the acting head of contracting activity here at ARPA-H. Uh, as Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Robbins discussed, the intent behind the Open BA is, is really uh, over the next year to pursue novel revolutionary ideas not currently covered by the specific programs. Um, I will sound like a broken record, so just apologies in advance, uh, but I'm gonna remind folks uh, to, to read the BAA. This is the ultimate tool to guide you on how best to submit. Um, so the broad agency announcement is a critical tool which allows for the government to um, which allows for the government to invite novel approaches to tackle a range of challenges not associated with a common work statement. So this is valuable considering the government will not evaluate submissions against one another, but really on their own merit. So the government will prioritize technical merit over toss allowing RPH to explore the art of the possible. So I promise you I sound like a broken record. Highly recommend you closely reading the BAA. Again, many of the questions that are, that are posed uh, can be found in the document itself. So another key value of, of the BAA is the capability to negotiate the award type. 
Uh, so uh, Dr. Wegerson talked about the fact that we're going to be using cooperative agreements, other transactions, uh, other transaction agreements or OTs, uh, and procurement contracts. And I'll talk about those briefly. Um, I do want to point out on a, that a typical, uh, an RPH typically applies a fail fast model to its vehicles. So they're aggressively tackling performance against clearly defined milestones. Considering the intent for our team to be heavily involved with the ultimate vehicle, um, this aligns more with the fail fast nature of ARPA. ARPA and really gets to the fact that why we're not going to be using any types of grants um, for our type of awards. Uh, we anticipate timelines will vary. Uh, so this is in the proposal process, will vary from abstract to full proposal uh, based on RPA H need. However, we will we do plan to aggressively pursue a 90-day clock from a CETA full, full proposal to award. Now, this is an ideal state. We're going to be pushing this is our goal. Uh, so we, we hope to attain that uh, because we really want to make sure that there is a clear line of and clear communication and expectation management from the time you submit to the time you actually uh, receive a response from the government. As mentioned in the uh, broad agency announcement, the government reserves the right to award to some, one, or no responses. Uh, and there's no ceiling on the overall BAA or individual awards. So cooperative agreements align very well. So talking about these are the, some of the vehicles, we're talking about cooperative agreements, OTs, and then procurement. So cooperative agreements align very well with an RFH because of the collaborative partnership allowed with the easily aligned public benefit within the RFH mission. So as mentioned, the ARPA fail fast model lends itself to substantial involvement from the government as program staff will be providing guidance and oversight throughout the performance. The value of cooperative agreements is that partnership again between the government and the performer. And cooperative agreements lend themselves to providing greater customization than uh, say procurement contracts. So moving on to other transactions. So for those folks that aren't familiar with OTs, they began in, uh, in the late 50s uh, through NASA. They're legally binding instruments or acquisition arrangements for uh, customizable uh, agreements. So really, the, the they're meant, they're, they're other than procurement contracts, grants, or cooperative agreements. And the, the intent of this was really to mimic commercial acquisition practices. Uh, similar to cooperative agreements, uh, OTs uh, can be uh, quite flexible to meet the dynamic challenge for a specific project. Uh, they help you prioritize and focus on risk of an intent as opposed to regulation by removing that rigidity of traditional procurement business rules. Ultimately, OTs promote trust in the spirit of cooperation between the government and the health ecosystem. So the last award type is a procurement contract. This is kind of the bread and butter uh, for, for most kind of federal acquisition uh, vehicles. Uh, this type of vehicle is typically used when there's a direct benefit uh, only really to the government. These procurements follow a very linear set of business rules governed by federal acquisition regulation and result in greater transparency and accountability. Just to be clear, this is likely kind of the least used vehicle uh, for, our, for this upcoming broad agency announcement. We're really gonna be prioritizing cooperative agreements and other transactions. Now that we've discussed the award types, let's discuss the BA process. A two-phase process uh, going from abstract submission and then if accepted, uh, being requested to receive, uh, provide a full proposal. Um, ARPA-H will submit a, uh, a, will conduct a scientific and technical review of each uh, conforming abstract proposal. So the abstract process, so just for those tracking on the BAA, which those nerds out there like myself probably have the BAA open beside them. Um, if you look on page 11, uh, this is a low barrier. And the intent of the abstract process was really to create a low barrier of entry for applicants uh, to participate in the process. The intent is to create a minimal hoops to jump through uh, at the onset of the idea submission by only requiring this three page submission. RPH will evaluate those submissions based on scientific and technical merit, proposal capabilities, and affordability. So those are kind of the, the three primary areas that we're going to be evaluating. If invited to submit a full proposal, uh, proposers must follow a more formal submission process in accordance with page 13 of the broad agency announcement, providing a technical and management approach proposal in addition to a full cost proposal, along with the statement of work. In addition to the abstract evaluation process, uh, the government will evaluate, uh, may evaluate cost realism and, and, um, and contribute in the, the proposer's contribution uh, and relevance to the RPH mission, which we'll talk about in just the next slide. 
So for the next two slides, as I mentioned, we'll talk about the evaluation criteria. Uh, so first, you have overall uh, scientific and technical merit. Uh, the proposed technical approach should be innovative, feasible, achievable, and complete. So these task descriptions and, and technical elements really provide for, really intend to provide a complete and logical sequence with all proposed deliverables clearly defined such that the final outcome that achieves the goal can be expected as a result of the goal. So moving on to the second factor, proposers' capabilities and related expertise. Uh, the proposed technical team, really are, we're looking for to ensure the proposed technical team has the expertise and experience to accomplish proposed tasks, right? And so really looking at, the, the key here is really describe similar efforts you've completed with the size and scope so that we can be able to understand and analyze that in more depth and detail. Because we want to make sure that your proposed uh, uh, prior expertise and similar efforts clearly demonstrates an ability to deliver products that meet the proposed uh, technical performance within the proposed budget and schedule. Moving on to our third factor, um, really looking at uh, potential contribution and relevance to the RPH mission. So uh, potential future R&D, commercial and other clinical applications, uh, really looking at whether the systems, uh, the applications may have uh, potential to address current or unmet need within the biomedics and, and improved health outcomes. Again, as I mentioned before, and as I said before, uh, and, and the prior presenters, uh, really looking for revolutionary, not evolutionary impact to transform uh, biomedicine and uh, improving health outcomes. So moving on to our uh, final uh, final evaluation factor, um, cost realism and price realism, re, re, excuse me, price reasonableness, uh, funding availability and affordability. So as mentioned during the abstract phrase, the uh, government will be focusing on affordability, right? In the proposer phase, RPH will be performing a more exhaustive price and cost analysis at, at, this, at this juncture. So price analysis really is performed to ensure each proposal uh, to ensure that there's reasonableness in overall price, making sure that it's not too high, right? On the converse, a cost realism analysis is a tool to discern whether or not the proposed costs are too low, right? Is this realistic to be able to perform the work and achieve the outcome proposed? So in addition to the evaluation, uh, we'll take into consideration the extent to which the proposed intellectual property rights structure will impact the government's ability to transition the technology. IP is a critical component and will be a key aspect of negotiations. So as Dr. Weigerzen, Dr. Jenkins, and Dr. Roberts uh, discussed, the key to success is providing a revolutionary, not evolutionary idea. These concepts must be uh, feasible with clear objectives and outcomes along with the personnel and strategy to execute. Submissions at both the abstract or proposed proposal phases should be clear, logical, and concise. Again, clear, logical, and concise. Uh, moving to other requirements, I strongly encourage federally funded development centers, so FFRDCs, and government entities follow page nine of the uh, broad agency announcement. Uh, proposers are responsible for submitting abstracts and proposals uh, to the Electronic Contract Proposal Submission, or ECPS, uh, website, which I'll put in the chat shortly, and ensure that received by the date and time specified. So we need to make sure to follow those deadlines. Uh, proposers must use the electronic submit, uh, transmission method. No other method for abstract or proposal will be permitted. Right? For proposals um, of cooperative agreements, a reminder to submit uh, form one uh, and form two. Form one is the SF-424. Uh, this is research and related or r, &R application for federal assistance, along with form two, the research and related senior key person, person profile, which is the expanded form. Lastly, please remember to review the BAA, uh, as this will be the guiding principle for us uh, for your submission and our evaluation process. Next, Dr. Jenkins will review uh, a few frequently asked questions uh, before we conduct our 30-minute uh, Q&A. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. So before I jump into some of the frequently asked FAQs already, I just want to really challenge the community to think about what those innovative technological leaps may be. We really want people to think about things that are, are maybe make you slightly um, nervous, that they may be difficult to achieve. That's absolutely the right ground we want to be in. And we really want to challenge this community to think very big and bold and bring us some of those big and bold ideas. So with that, I'll move into some of the already received FAQs that we have. Those have been posted on SAM.gov, and you are able to see these. A couple quick notes about our upcoming question and answer session. So the first is, I am reminding you, there are almost 2,000 people on this webinar. Do not submit your very specific tech topics. 
So if you have a very specific technology that you would like ARPA H to uh, comment on, we will not comment on those in this forum. And we cannot, obviously, with 2,000 folks on this um, webinar, offer one-on-one -on -one calls. We are asking you to submit your feed, your abstract, to the Open Broad Agency announcement so that we can give you uh, feedback in that method. Um, additionally, for those who joined late, the uh, questions that we answer at 1230 will be posted as part of a written FAQ, and they will be posted on SAM.gov, as will the link to be able to watch this webinar over again. So with that, I'm going to jump into some of the frequently asked questions that we've already had. These may be some low-hanging fruit. I'm not just going to read this. Um, you know, I know everybody's probably scribbling furiously. I will leave these up for a few minutes. But one thing I do want to point out, we have had several questions require asking about um, what the types of, of uh, groups that can apply. So applicants are open to universities, businesses, small businesses, nonprofits, individuals, and non-US entities, as long as you're subject to the requirements that are included in the BAA, section 3.a.2. So please read that section closely. ARPA-H does not have a preference with respect to entity type or team size. You did hear me talk about those teaming and collaborative projects. We do not have a preference there. And as you have heard already, we are limiting our awards to cooperative agreements, other transactions, and procurement contracts. Some other common FAQs, the BAA does not have a funding limit for individual awards. It does not have a limit on the period of performance for individual awards. And it does not have um, a, a limit on the individual focus area. So groups can work across several of our focus areas. We do understand that efforts that may be submitted to the Open Broad Agency announcement may actually, you could probably make an argument for them being under one or two or maybe even more of our focus areas, and that is okay. Um, you can submit the one that is the most relevant. Um, I will say that in the period of performance, as you heard Renee say in the very beginning, our programs that are run by program managers and our larger efforts, those will typically be anywhere from two to four, maybe even five years. We would anticipate that efforts that come in through our open broad agency announcement would be shorter than those as far as a period of performance. Um, there are uh, submission deadlines, and I know that I've seen some questions in the Q&A that are related to the submission deadline of March 14th, 2024. That is for this open broad agency announcement and for submitting abstracts to this. The April 7th deadline is for the DARPA, the ARPA dash, and that is a separate, um, that is a separate uh, entity outside of the open broad agency announcement. This open broad agency announcement is accepting applications for abstracts through March, 20, Mar March 14th of 2024. As you can see here, and this will remain posted while we are collating questions, there is a questions mailbox. If you are not able to get your questions submitted during this question and answer period, you feel, please feel free to send that information into that mailbox. And then finally, Again, we've talked about the scope. We are looking for things all the way from proof of concept through fairly mid and, and large scale efforts that would prove through a, a potential future market or show that there may be a potential commercial market. Um, we are asking for uh, a ROM in the, uh, in the abstract. So that's a rough order of magnitude of the expected cost of an, of an effort uh, as part of that abstract to help us in that abstract reviewing. So with that, I just want to give, we're going to, we're going to end here. We're going to pause and we're going to allow folks to submit questions. And we are going to go off screen and we're going to work on preparing our answers to those questions. Um, please submit your question through the Q&A. We will come back at 1230 to answer as many of those questions as we can answer in 30 minutes. So we do anticipate that we will be able to get through many of those questions. And any that we do not will be posted as part of an FAQ on SAM.gov. So please submit your questions now. And we look forward to talking to everybody in about 30 minutes. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon for those folks on the uh, on the East Coast. Uh, still good morning to those folks on the West Coast. Um, quick shout out for the uh, for interested individuals submitting to the Dash Challenge before we get into Q&A. Uh, per the QR code that was on the screen, responses are due this Friday at midnight, so I'm very excited uh, to see your response. 
Um, so just a heads up, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes going through some of our questions in the room. Um, we are going to be joined by our illustrious um, uh, grants, cooperative agreements, and uh, contracting officer, um, Brian Daniels, who's going to be answering some of the acquisition questions. Um, we reviewed a high volume of the technical questions, ranging, um, ranging from uh, various technical fields. Uh, we do not plan to provide specific direction during our responses. We intentionally kept the bar uh, low uh, for our abstract process. So we really just encourage you to submit that three-page abstract so that we can provide judgment from there. So if we don't get to your question, I apologize. We will certainly be um, providing responses and the full FAQ along with this recording and slides uh, at the conclusion of the, uh, or hopefully within the next couple of days, actually. All right, so getting to our first couple of questions. Um, will the recording be available to our participants? Just to reiterate that, um, yes, it will be available, including this Q&A portion. Moving on to the next question. Um, our company has four white papers uh, of three pages, each containing new technology medical breakthroughs. How do we submit these papers and when can we expect a subsequent meeting to discuss our technologies? Uh, Dr. Jenkins, could you respond to that? We are not going to provide one-on-one -on -one meetings, as I mentioned during the um, during the discussion. That there's too many people to do that. So abstracts for anything technical should be submitted through our open broad agency announcement, and we will review them and provide feedback. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question: The VA is open for a year. Is there any reason or advantage to submitting sooner rather than later? Meaning, might the money run out in the mid-year or? Will all awards be made after March 2024? Uh, Dr. Weberson, could you respond to that one? Yeah, so starting immediately, submissions and awards will be made on a rolling basis. So go ahead, get your ideas in as soon as possible. Uh, we'll be reviewing those and, and you'll get that feedback again, awards and submissions on a rolling basis. And when you, uh, if you are successful in your abstract, we will let you know the submission date for your full proposal. Thank you. All right. Next question: Are these funding opportunities are these funding opportunities more suitable for basic or clinical research? How to how do we make basic research a better fit? Over to Dr. Roberts. Yes, RBH will be developing a balanced portfolio across both basic and applied research uh, categories, including clinical research. All right. Thank you. Next question: Who reviews the open BAA submissions, Dr. Wagerson? So generally speaking, uh, the reviews will be conducted by a team of government technical experts comprising mostly of ARPA-H staff, but we will bring in other U.S. government uh, experts. But ultimately, the ARPA-H government employees will be the decision makers, and we look to those subject matter experts for their perspective and recommendations. All right, don't go too far. Next question is back over to you. Is the concept of ARPA-H uh, similar to DARPA or, or run by the DOD? Is ARPA-H run by the DOD? Well, we've ad adopted the DARPA business model, but we are not run by the Department of Defense. We are under Health and Human Services and established within the National Institutes of Health. All right, thank you. Uh, so after a PI submits an abstract, an ECPS, can we then submit the full uh, application via grants.gov workspace like we would do for DARPA or IARPA's uh, submissions if we are requesting a, you know, or if we're requesting a cooperative grant? No, grants.gov is not being utilized. Uh, full proposals will be only be accepted by invitation and abstract review. All right, next question. Um, do Department of Energy National Labs qualify for these proposals? I'm gonna kick it over to my colleague, Mr. Daniels. Uh, yes, they do, but please see section uh, 3A1, FFRDCs in the BAA, and FFRDCs have special rules, they have contracts, so uh, make sure that whatever the rules are for, con for doing um, research on behalf of government agencies, that you work with your contracting officer or whomever else to figure that out. All right, uh, moving on to the next question. Who are the program managers and their academic background? Dr. Weggerson? For information about ARPA-H's program managers, I want to direct you to our website when you can look at ARPA-H dot arpa-h.gov uh, about our people um and but just a reminder that we are going to be hiring uh, program managers on a rolling basis i hope uh, to hire about 20 program managers this year um and they'll continue to grow over the next uh years as we go forward um and if one of you would like to become a program manager uh look at our careers uh portion of our website where you can also see uh the the simple but intense uh program manager application thank you all right what is the expected turnaround time 
to get to a go no go decision for an abstract BA submission? So great question. Um, abstracts can be submitted and will be evaluated on a rolling basis. Uh, abstract feedback is anticipated to be approximately four to six weeks from receipt. Uh, depending on the volume of submissions received, RPH may reserve uh, the right to adjust the expected evaluation timelines or to ensure the integrity of the review process. Um, and more importantly, there may be a time where we may be asking you to submit at a, uh, for a proposal at a, at a, at a downstream date uh, to allow us uh, an opportunity to be able to tackle uh, evaluations on a timely basis. If the timelines need to be adjusted, updates will be posted on SAM.gov uh, to provide transparency. Moving on to the next question, is one program manager taking responsibility for one project or, or multiple projects? Dr. Wagerson? Yep, so each individual project will be managed by one program manager ultimately, but each PM is expected to manage multiple programs and multiple projects. Awesome. So next question, how do we find out who is our assigned program manager? Uh, uh, Ryan? Um, this will be communicated during contract negotiations. Perfect. Now, thank you for that. Uh, next question, is ARPA-H looking just and only for projects focusing on clinical medicine, cure diseases, or highly focused on patients, i.e. people with diseases already, or public health, preventative health, health promotion, et cetera? Will, will those areas be considered? The examples are usually very basic science, mo uh, e.g. molecules for a new medicine, or to cure diseases. Uh, Jen, could you help us answer that question? That's a great list of options, and we're interested in all of the above. Awesome. Thank you for that. Next question. Are you looking for translational ideas, basic science, or both? Amy, could you help us out with that one? Yeah, the answer is both. As it states in the, in the BAA, um, we will foster innovations across the spectrum of technology readiness levels, all the way from those foundational proof of concept experiments, all the way through to prototypes that will enter into the marketplace. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. When does the BA close, Ryan? It closes on March 14, 2024. Um, so submissions will be received on a rolling basis. So please get them in as soon as you are ready. Yeah, certainly uh, excited to, to see your abstracts and, and excited for uh, the responses. I will point out that the, the BA does not, if we don't make a ward by the closed date of the BA, that does not end the project. We just need to be able in receipt of the, uh, of the abstract by that date. Uh, next question, are the proposers supposed to be U.S. citizens or can they be green card holders as well? Ryan, back to you. Um, please review section 3A2, page 10 um, of the BAA. It describes the eligibility requirements. Uh, RPH does have some special uh, eligibility requirements, so uh, please do read that carefully as uh, the BAA reflects it is. All right, next question. Can an entity make multiple submissions? Amy? Very easy. Yes, you can make multiple submissions under one entity. Who are the program managers and where can I find a list? Dr. Wagerson? Yep, once again, just want to uh, refer folks to our website under our people. You'll, you'll on a on an as-hired basis, you'll start to see that program manager uh, list grow uh, during the course of the year. All right, next question. Where can I find in the instructions for submission, form dates, requirements? I tried to connect to links uh, from the BA, but I got some several broken links which slowed a page not found. So I will say that uh, we, we tried to make it as clear as possible in the BA submission information. Um, and we can also put a link to that in the chat, uh, just because there was also the QR code that was posted on the screen. So hopefully that will work out, but the submission instructions are clearly iterated in the BAA. Next question, what is the April 8th deadline that I've heard people mention? The webinar mentions kind of a rolling deadline. Dr. Weger, is it back to you? Yeah, we have a few open solicitations right now at ARPA-H, and actually the April 7th deadline that we mentioned is for our ARPA-H dash. Uh, we did not talk about that today in detail, but you can look again at our website for the ARPA-H dash, uh, really meant to engage a broad uh, variety of folks, and that closes this Friday, not the Open BAA. The Open BAA is open until March of this next year, um, and that is where we are taking applications on a, on a rolling basis. Perfect. So next question, if submissions are rolling for for one year, uh, at what point will awards notifications or attempt award be made? Uh, Dr. Roberts? Great, submissions, reviews, and awards will be made on a rolling basis. Awesome, uh, and, and thank you, Connor, for putting that link in the chat. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, who, what is ARPA-H's interest in biomanufacturing? Dr. Jenkins? 
Yeah, so ARPA-H is interested in revolutionary ideas. You heard me talk about that. And uh, we are, biomanufacturing innovation would be included as part of those revolutionary ideas. All right, don't go too far. Will decisions on submitted abstracts be rolling as well? Yes, decisions on submitted abstracts will be rolling as well. And we anticipate a four to six week turnaround time on those abstract decisions. All right, what is the timeline post-submission and when will we receive feedback and, and, and start dates? Over to Dr. Babich. Great. As Amy just mentioned, we anticipate four to six weeks uh, between abstracts and feedback on that. If there's a request for a proposal, we are shooting for the ideal of 90 days between proposal submission and award. Now, that is, of course, subject to uh, the um, negotiations and folks working efficiently with our contracting office. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Let's see here. Um, once a print proposal is submitted, does the organization need to wait for the close of the BAA before getting an approval or rejection? Ryan, back to you. Um, as stated, it's on a rolling basis, so no. Awesome, thank you. Uh, are you planning to use external reviewers, Dr. Rogerson? Yes, absolutely. We'll be using external government reviewers. Again, uh, the program manager is the decision maker. All right, so we have a mo long multi-part question, so I'm gonna try to uh, try to get through it and I'll, I can read it again once I'm done. Is a, uh, is a very important uh, point of emphasis with an application to the broad agency announcement to bring at least some of the right stakeholders into the project. Relatedly, will there be assistance from program managers once funded? I'm new pro, uh, assistant professors seeking to build new networks. I may need some assistance bringing in all the stakeholders to the table. I heard Dr. Jenkins speak a bit about the 11.15 a.m., um, 11.25, excuse me, a.m., but still wanted to open up more of a discussion and find out how much of this we should be tackling in the application itself. So getting to the question again, uh, getting to the emphasis is, uh, how do we bring in the right stakeholders into a project relatedly there? Um, once it's, uh, will there be assistance from the program managers once funded? Uh, over to you, Dr. Rogers. So first and foremost, uh, really excited to have uh, some, some early stage assistant professors uh, looking at ARPA-H as an opportunity. This is a, a place to take big risks. Um, we are, for whatever the solution is that you want to solve under your proposal, we do expect you to do teaming and bring um, all those players to the table. So if you are missing a critical key personnel as part of your project, we will not bring those folks to the table. Uh, so, so definitely reach out to your networks. Um, what we will do at ARPA-H uh, we have access to those government stakeholders. So, you know, FDA, CMS, others that, that may uh, really help you translate and bring those outside of ARPA-H. Um, that is what we will provide. We also have uh, our PATIO transition office, which stands for the Project Acceleration Transition Innovation Office. And they will be working with all program managers and performer teams uh, to be able to, to help transition things out of the lab and into the real world. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. All right. Um, does physical infrastructure include critical instrumentation for the project? Uh, what is your policy on equipment purchases? Over to Dr. Roberts. Uh, so the restriction on physical infrastructure does not include critical instrumentation. So to say that in a different way, we will consider support for critical instrumentation on a case-by-case -case basis. Awesome. Thank you. So as a young small business owner, I'm curious if this funding can be targeted toward business development alongside product uh, development research. How does RPH target small business contracts? I'm excited about this question, but uh, Dr. Wagerson, could you respond? So as you know, we're, we're targeting novel proposals, uh, really irrespective of firm size. We want big and small business, large and small businesses. We also want academics, but uh, we will not fund proposals that are exclusively business development, but we understand that might be a key part of technology innovation and translation. So uh, go ahead and submit a proposal that may include this, and we'll have a discussion during negotiations um, if this is fair and appropriate for the work that's been proposed. All right. Are medical devices in the scope of this funding? Dr. Roberts? Yes, medical devices are in scope. Right. So moving on, um, does a project have to fit into one of the focus areas or can they span across two or more focus areas? And uh, Dr. Jenkins, we've gotten this question on a frequent basis. Could you respond to this? No, projects do not have to fit into one focus area. They can span across two or more focus areas. Um, yes. All right, and then- I'll Leave it there. <laughs> my understanding is, um, 
submission to the VA under one focus area, again, can cross into that other focus area. That is right? correct, okay. yes. I want to hand foot stop that. That's correct. How would proposals be reviewed and selected? So I'll take this one. Proposals will be evaluated based on the evaluation criteria described in the BAA. So during our presentation today, we kind of went through the various uh, factors associated with uh, abstract and full proposal evaluations. So I encourage you to go back to, once we post the link to this uh, presentation or to the slides that we post, uh, to refer back to those. All right, so these are the, the questions we were able to get to during our 30 minute time frame. Um, I do uh, really want to thank everyone for their participation today. Lots of uh, heavy activity. I do want to point out there are a number of questions that we weren't weren't able to get to. I'm getting a lot of looks in the room to keep going. So we're going to answer a handful of uh, more questions. So all right, going to next question. Let's see here. Um, to what extent is ARPH interested in revolutionary approaches in acquiring using data to discover novel, effective uh, individual, community, and population level non-clinical interventions that have the potential to dramatically improve health outcomes? And I, I will point out, this is a great example of some of those that um, we received some great like, hey, what do you think about this idea? We really do encourage you to submit an abstract and, and really look forward to seeing your idea on paper. All right. Let me the incoming question around intellectual property. Yes. How is intellectual property handled with ARPA H? So we focused in on margin rights or something more. So this is a this is a very important question. The, the government does not intend to take significant amount of intellectual property. Our approach is really to find a balanced a balanced approach and perspective to ensure that we're also protecting the, the taxpayer interest while also ensuring that the entity is, is maintaining and has a marketable uh, solution uh, that will be advanced uh, in, in the future to our customer base. Finalization of, of rights or, or uh, IP will be determined during negotiations of proposals. So highly recommend that we focus in and have a clear intent uh, of, of intellectual property. The government will have a clear approach for our, our intellectual property interest on that specific project when we approach it for negotiations. All right. Is there a small business set aside within ARPA H? So I'll just take this one real quick. Um, so not on the open VA, there is no small business set aside, where as uh, Dr. Wegerson pointed out, we're accepting uh, responses from both large and small businesses. So another question, while you mentioned no limit on funding, are there general funding ranges attached to award type? So example, 10 million for an OTA, 1 million for a cooperative agreement. Dr. Roberts, can you take this one? So the important thing is that the cost of the proposal needs to be commensurate with the scope of the technical work. So we want to see that pairing between this is the technical work that I proposed and here's a realistic cost for doing that. Mm -hmm. We do not anticipate that the uh, cost will be tied to a particular type of award. Perfect. So might ARP H be able to work with independent inventors with software capable of accelerating genomics by commuting diagnostics and treatment response um, phenotypes about chronic disorders. Um, so I wanna just focus in again, these are examples of some of the, the approaches. We're not gonna provide a specific direction, um, yay or nay, but we really do encourage you to submit a full abstract and we can evaluate from there. I want to jump in on this one, Benjamin. So we're getting a lot of questions in the chat and then numerous questions that we received. Uh, is, is AI for health relevant? Uh, what about small molecule libraries? So um, again, the scope is incredibly broad for ARPA-H. The focus areas that we've defined are meant to be illustrative of the type of work that we would like to do, but the big ideas are up to you. And reminder that we base all of our programs around the Heilmeier Catechism, the questions, but you should think about your concept in that way too. So what problem are you trying to solve? How is it done today? And what is that new insight in your approach that you think is going to be game-changing? If you can answer those questions solidly, yes, is the answer to all of those questions around specific capabilities technologies. This is a place for breakthroughs. And so we will not be responding about very specific projects. Um, please submit an abstract and we'll provide you that, that specific technical feedback at that point. Thank you, Dr. Rogerson. Um, another question that came in, does ARPA-H require preliminary data? Dr. Jenkins, can you respond to this one? Sure. No, there is no requirement for preliminary data for ARPA-H uh, abstracts. Awesome. Next question. Does the BAA allow multi- 
uh, PI proposals over to you, Dr. Rutgerson? Yep, so multiple primary investigators, absolutely. So uh, we, were, we are expecting teams for our projects to be successful because they're so ambitious and we um, encourage that in your proposals. All right. As are hospitals eligible or ineligible to submit VA abstract or proposals? Dr. Roberts? Yes, hospitals are eligible. Many hospitals fall into that nonprofit category as well. So hospitals are eligible. All right. So let's see here. Um, yeah. Let's see. If I don't have a technical partner for a critical and innovative uh, elements, will RBH help me find that? Uh, Dr. Wagerson? So in general, no. When you're uh, submitting your proposal, you should definitely have in mind uh, who are the teaming partners that are critical for you to be successful. Um, however, during the course of an effort, if there is a technical breakthrough that somebody at RBH is aware of that may be beneficial to you, we can make those introductions during uh, the period of performance. But uh, you bring the team to the table at the proposal stage. So, thank you, Dr. Rutgerson. Is there an October award deadline to release a specific amount of funding uh, to proposals? So uh, I'll take that one. The only deadline included in the BA is for the abstract submission uh, and to ensure that we meet it within that um, that uh, year-long process that the uh, VA is available. So again, through March uh, 2024. All right, next question. A requirement appears to be that a proposed novel idea be disease agnostic. If a research collaboration is focusing on motor challenges and, for example, autism spectrum disorder, then to what range of other conditions should that approach be applicable? For example, would applicability to motor challenges in dystonia, Parkinson's disease, and ALS be sufficient? Is this too broad or not sufficiently agnostic? Um, moving, I'll, I'll, I'll kick this over to Dr. Jenkins. Great. So while we did say that we want approaches that are disease agnostic and they are encouraged, we are not requiring that an approach be disease agnostic. Disease agnostic approaches are, are we are interested in those, but they do not, it is not a requirement. So while the, the things that are mentioned here, they can be really evaluated if you submit an abstract and they would be evaluated accordingly. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. As RPH format is new for many biomedical researchers, researchers are there sample three pagers available as exemplars? Uh, Ryan? Um, no, but please do review the BAA section 3D uh, content and form for instructions. Yeah, we really, thank you, Ryan. We really try to uh, lay out the criteria as clearly and simply as possible. Again, try and decrease the barrier of entry to be able to put those novel ideas on paper um, so that we can be able to review those and, and, and potentially uh, quickly adjudicate those going forward. For newer therapeutic modalities that satisfy the criteria of ARPA-H, how far into clinical trials will ARPA-H be interested in supporting to de-risk uh, show or show proof of concept? Uh, Dr. Jenkins, can you respond to that one? Sure. So we are, like I said during the presentation, uh, clinical studies are relevant, and we want to push technologies that, as we say at ARPA-H, can survive in the wild. And oftentimes, on a therapeutic modality or diagnostic modality, you don't know if they will have commercial relevance until you've at least shown safety in the clinic. And oftentimes, that could also include needing to show efficacy. So we are open to clinical trials. We will move things through clinical development. But what we won't do, as I stated in the earlier um, section, was we will not take one single product that already has some clinical relevance through advanced development. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jenkins. So another question that came in, what if revolutionary and a new way uh, to look at things actually suggests a simpler or not more complex path forward? Simpler might imply smaller funding tie amount, for instance. Would that be frowned upon for being too small? Uh, no, smaller awards will be considered. Uh, the VA does not spe specify a particular range. We're really looking at revolutionary ideas, uh, not revolutionary dollars. So we want to make sure that we um, that we, we emphasize that. All right, let's see here. Next question. Is there any guidance on the size and location of heterogeneity uh, of the team from residing within one large institution to groups from many institutions across the country or world? Dr. Jenkins? No, applicants should propose the team that you that are necessary to achieve the proposed goals. We do not have um, requirements around the team team size or the team um, composite. Uh, well, I just want to I'm going to check around the room one more time. Um, I think we we've answered as many questions as we could during this. There are more questions, and we hope to get to those and post those 
um, within uh, the next few days um, so that you all can kind of see that along with the, uh, the recording of this and the slides. Uh, I really do thank you all for participating in this proposer's day for our ARPA H uh, Open BAA. Look forward to your abstracts and look forward to your ongoing questions as we uh, as we try to take on revolutionary ideas to achieve how, how that comes for everyone. Thank you all for your time and, and have a great day. Thanks, all. Thank you.